Welcome to our Sunday morning online worship service. I'm Richard Jones, the lead pastor here at St. Mark's United Methodist Church in Indy Atlantic. We are so thankful that you've joined us this morning and this season of Advent in which we begin to be prepared for the coming of the Christ child. A couple of announcements for us today. On December 2nd, which is a Wednesday, will be our first in, four, in a series of four Advent meditation studies that will be here in the sanctuary, Wednesdays at 1230. And um, they'll be uh, socially distant and you have to wear a mask if you wanna attend. It'll be in person and it will be mostly meditation, quiet prayer and scripture reading led by me. I hope you can attend. And if you do attend, remember your mask. Now, this is also going to be live streamed, which means you can watch it on Facebook. If you'd like to do that, we'll be emailing everyone a link on Wednesday morning of how to watch it online. Please look out for that link. Also, starting November 29th, which is Sunday, the lawn service will start at 4.30 p.m. Due to darkness, we want to make sure that everyone can uh, enjoy the service and get home before dark. So our lawn worship services out in front of the church beginning November 29th will be at 4.30 p.m. December 13th, our worship on the lawn will be an all-out Christmas sing-along. So we hope that you come out and bring some friends and be ready to sing songs out on the lawn. Our Christmas Sunday will be December 20th, and we're going to have an in-person, in-the-sanctuary worship service, socially distanced also, and you must wear a mask. Um, and we also will ask that you RSVP for this service and please look out for that RSVP. David Woodford will be sending the email out. Our Christmas Eve candlelight service will begin at 5 p.m. out on the lawn on December 24th on Christmas Eve. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you this morning. And I want to say a special welcome to our winter residents who some of them have already come back and we're so glad to have you back with us. It's always good to find in the winter time when I know that you're much warmer here than you would be if you'd stayed way up north. So good to have you. Well, it's official. The neighbors down the street have this big blow up Santa Claus in their front yard and across the street they have a bigger one with more lights on it. We've got competition going. But the good thing is that just a little further down the block, they have a beautiful nativity scene out in their front yard. And that warms my heart. Glad to see that. The sanctuary looks nice. Put me in the good mood. Make me ready for the excitement and the anticipation of looking forward to Christmas. My prayer is that during these uncertain times, we can find room in our hearts for the joy that comes from Christmas with the expectation of the coming of the Christ child. And as always, I turn to the Bible when I look for reassurance. So this is Isaiah 40, three through five. A voice cries out, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people shall see it together for the voice of the Lord has spoken. Let's pray. Oh Lord, our God, you are the hope 
of all the world. Prepare us for the coming of Jesus. We want to welcome him with gladness and faithfulness. In these days when we're crowded with anxiety, create in us a quiet place of light and peace where we can keep these holidays as the holy days that they were meant to be. For us and for those people we love, we ask for the gifts that only you can give, the gifts of comfort, compassion, and love. And as we receive, may we freely give. Some of us are separated from family now, and that makes us sad and even lonely. Please let our hearts experience the spiritual joy of concentrating our thoughts and, and our worship on you. Let us remember, Lord, that you so loved the world that you gave us your son. He came without all the fancy wrapping, but he came with power and grace to show us the way to live. Especially now, in this Advent season, come and make a place for us to share with you all of that power and that grace. Let Christ be born anew in each of us as we go forth toward that joyous Christmas day. Receive our thanks, our praise, and our prayers. For Jesus' sake, amen.
morning, will you share with me the Advent reading for this first Advent, first Sunday in Advent for this year. This is from Luke 10, 21 through 24. At that same hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then turning to the disciples, Jesus said to them privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Advent 2020, a time that begins our new Christian year, a time of hope signaling the end of a year of trials, sadness, and separation. Advent 2020 is our opportunity to reclaim God's faithful promises to us and to accept his presence in the midst of our pandemics as the reigning Prince of Peace. At Advent, we look forward to Christ's return while acknowledging our role in his kingdom here and now. We desire to answer his call to partake and participate in making room for the divine in our hearts. Advent's first gift prepares us for the conspiracy of Christmas to come by revealing within us a spirit of gratitude. We light the candle of gratitude because God is the giver of all good things. And because God is gracious, compassionate, and steadfast in love, our gratitude is to reflect God's faithful joy in giving, even when we experience times of want, grief, suffering, and disillusionment. May the light of gratitude within us prepare us for Emmanuel, the greatest gift given for all. He is the coming Messiah who will come again to fill the world with gratitude. We will worship and conspire against the spirit of defeat, despair, and division and allow the power of gratitude to guide our actions and our service and prepare us for the conspiracy of Christmas. Our reading for today comes from Luke chapter 1, verses 68 through 79. Blessed be the Lord, God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty savior for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus, he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham, to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the ways of peace. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for carrying us through this year as we arrive now at the first Sunday of Advent 2020. Prepare us for the fullness of your grace, the newness of your uh, renewing love, 
And as we look forward to Christmas, that our hearts would be guided by your light. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our sermon series for this Advent is called Preparing for the Conspiracy of Christmas. Conspiracy theories abound now more than ever. With the power of technology and the internet, conspiracy theories spread like raging wildfires. They're influencing people now from all walks of life. They influence how people think, how people behave, and as we've seen lately, how people treat other people. I'm pretty certain that this year, 2020 ranks as probably one of the top, if not the top year where most conspiracy theories have come out in the modern era. Conspiracy theories have been around since the beginning of time and they of course mix some truths with some facts and some falsehoods and some mysteries and people fill in the blanks with all kinds of nefarious and outlandish ideas. They are so powerful that they make human beings come together and form groups, form cults, form um, habits, and dedicate their entire lives to trying to answer the mysteries of these so-called theories. Now, conspiracy theories spread often lies that are hurtful and falsehoods about people and about situations that end up hurting others. And this we must guard against. Of course, the classical conspiracy theories for the most part have to do with government cover-ups or unexplained events in the world that people want to make sense of. And uh, we've mentioned some negative ones or how things uh, occur and how conspiracy theories can be damaging. But for the most part, I think the majority of them are somewhat entertaining and fun. The Roswell UFO conspiracy, for example, where they still believe that aliens landed and crash landed and there's, um, you know, autopsies were done and there's um, uh, alien ships being uh, kept in a secret locker, probably in Area 51, which is another very hot spot of conspiracy theories. Of course, you have the conspiracy theories about Bigfoot and, of course, the Bermuda Triangle and others. Recently, just as two days ago, there was a new one, or a possible for a new conspiracy theory, because on the news they showed that these um, folks in Utah, this uh, group of people in a helicopter who were counting uh, goats or uh, uh, sheep in the countryside in the desert, found this monolithic rectangle in the middle of nowhere made out of riveted sheet metal. It stands about 12 feet high, 3 feet wide, wedged into the rock floor of the desert about 3 to 4 feet, they estimate, into the rock. This is about 90 miles from any known city. There is no roads going there. And so no one knows how it got there, but they're investigating. And already the conspiracy theories abound. There might be some secret Mormon worship temple or um, some uh, kind of prank that uh, alludes to that famous movie, the 2001 Space Odyssey, where a monolith was very much a part of the movie. Who knows? The thing is, is that conspiracy theories come up every day. Of course, the word conspiracy means this by the, the dictionary of Webster, the act of conspiring together, an agreement among conspirators. And to conspire means to make secret plans jointly to commit some kind of act, usually an unlawful one, Webster's also defines it as to act in harmony towards accomplishing an end. Synonyms are collusion, schemes, or plots. Now the conspiracy of Christmas is the act and the plan of God, which is inviting all of humanity to overturn and undo the evil and the darkness of the world. 
There are lots of conspiracies that try to explain away this plan that God has given us this plan that God's love has revealed in and through his son Jesus, that God desires to use in order for us to become who he has meant us to become all along, to save us. And Advent is a season in which we're reminded that we are invited to conspire with God towards a better end, towards a better future. Advent invites us and challenges us to resist the temptation of the false narratives of life that defeat us and to receive the revelation from the Holy Spirit to be ready to act in harmony towards the common end of serving and praising the Prince of Peace who is coming into the world, who is the light of the world that endows us with many gifts. One of the many gifts and one of the crucial aspects about being prepared to receive the gift of Christmas is the preparation that gratitude gives us. Zechariah, who was the person who spoke the words in Luke chapter one that we read, he is the father of John the Baptist and he is speaking about his son, John the Baptist in that scripture. And it was a surprise to everyone that Zechariah um, uh, was kind of having this prophetic utterance because he had been mute and unable to speak for nine months. Why? Because nine months earlier, he was serving as the priest in the temple, a very honored uh, 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 thing to be chosen for. Not many priests got the opportunity to serve in the temple but he was able to serve in the temple as the priest. And uh, as he was doing his work there, he got a vision from God and God told him he would, he and his wife Elizabeth would have a son, that his son would be this person, this prophesied one who would go before and prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah. And uh, he uh, didn't quite believe it. And so he was, uh, made mute by the angel of the Lord. And so everyone was surprised that when he came out of that temple, he wasn't able to speak. And um, they were also surprised that Elizabeth was pregnant. They were both older people. And so not normally in the age of having children, but Elizabeth, lo and behold, bears a child. And the question is what to name the child. And um, Elizabeth says, well, we're going to name him John. And everyone was like, that's crazy. That's a crazy idea. No one in your family is named John. And so they went to Zechariah to ask him and uh, he had to get a tablet and write on the tablet, yes, his name will be John. And this was the beginning or the continuation of Zechariah allowing the conspiracy of Christmas to take hold in his life. And his words here spoken in Luke chapter one are his testimony and his words of gratitude because he now knows and realizes that the plan of God in his life has been fulfilled and through him and his wife's son, this boy named John would be the one prophesied. So Zechariah was humble he was not one of these very um, outlandish people. So for him to act in this way was very out of character for him. His faith had been waning, just like many people in Israel's faith had been waning. For many years, people's faith had been lost. They had be begun to think that God had forgotten them. Religious leaders were making um, deals with political pundits and striking up kind of um, conspiracy theories uh, in order to maintain their, um, their, their level of influence in society. And this was leaving the people behind and people were in despair, just like Zachariah and Elizabeth were before they received this gift of grace in the message and the vision that John would be the one preparing the way for the Messiah. 
So Zechariah surprises everyone by going along with this crazy idea that his son would now be the one spoken of from the prophets of old. Zechariah's words begin with a proclamation that God's steadfast promises will be true. That yes, this son of his will be an advocate for this new conspiracy theory, this new uh, development in which God is going to unfold before them the vision of salvation through his son. And through faith and in gratitude, Zechariah claims that this is an amazing new beginning for people, for the people of Israel, that uh, uh, counter to the conspiracy theories that people had been teaching, that God was distant, that God did not care, that you had to disown your brothers and sisters and um, make uh, contracts, uh, legal or otherwise, or religious, in order to stay afloat because God would not come to your rescue. Zechariah joins um, in the spirit of the prophets and in the spirit of King David and of Abraham in proclaiming that God's steadfast promises are true. And he begins to proclaim with the gift of gratitude the fact that the conspiracy of the saving grace of God would soon be revealed because his son was living proof that God was keeping his promises and that you did not need some kind of conspiracy theory or some kind of, of ideology that mixed in with all of the things that were going on would oppress some and liberate others, but that the liberation and the salvation of God was for all. You see, the gift of gratitude is one of the most important signposts of the coming of the Messiah. The claim that God's actions now are being explained and known as God's mercy is being poured out into us is an opportunity for us to capture and visualize and live out a life without fear in the light of God's kingdom that is breaking forth into the present. We can respond to all things around us with gratitude because we can join together with the coordination of the creator of all the world, the famous ancient of days, the conspirator of truth to overcome the shadow collectives of the brokenness of our world. With gratitude, we can begin to draw the chalk lines around the falling away of the false conspiracy theories that steal our joy, that rob us of our divine image, that turn us into enemies of each other instead of families, brothers and sisters. Through the gift of gratitude, all weapons formed against us will fail because the Lord has declared it and is sending his messenger before us to speak words of influence and of forgiveness to prepare in our lives and in the world the way of the Lord and to teach, by the way, the ways of the Lord. This Advent season, let us be reminded, right, that this Christmas we can live out the gift of gratitude as a way to undo the falsehoods and the lies that destroy our fellowships and our community. Advent reminds us that this Christmas is a time to live gratefully and to let great, great, great to, live, to allow grace to flow through our hearts as we conspire with the Holy Spirit, with the spirit of life, to bring harmony to our lives, to the circumstances around us, and to the brokenness of our world. Because Emmanuel, the grace giver, God with us, is coming. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, love divine, that came down at Christmas and showed us the face of God. We pray, Lord God, that we, with graceful hearts, would follow you, that we would prepare for this Advent season, 
room in our lives, in our homes, and in our families for each other, for you and for your will, that we would put aside the lies, put aside the brokenness, put aside the darkness that continues to make us afraid to step out in faith and believe in you and believe in what you are doing in the world as you make all things new. Let us begin with being grateful, with doing acts of kindness, with responding to your grace by being gracious. So we thank you for your presence with us this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the testimony of Zechariah and for how this speaks to us and connects us with the conspiracy of hope, with the conspiracy of your divine saving grace that begun even before the beginning of time. And so, Lord, we join with you in declaring this, that you are true, that you are steadfast, and that you are with us. Come, Emmanuel, gift giver of grace. We receive you with grateful hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. of my enemies It's your body and your blood you shed for me This is how I fight my battles There's a table that you've prepared for me In the presence of my enemies your body and your blood you shed for me. This is how I fight my battles. And I This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. In the valley, I know that you're with me. Surely your goodness and your mercy follow me. So my weapons are praise and thanksgiving. This is how I fight my battles. And I believe you've overcome it. I will lift my song. Surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It 
I know it's hard to believe that Christmas is around the corner. I'm sure that if you're like me, I'm really happy to see the year 2020 in the rearview mirror. We started this year with lots of hope, with lots of anticipation of what God would do. And I believe that God is still doing many great and wonderful things. It's just we need to let our, the eyes of our heart be opened to his graciousness and to his gifts of hope in the midst of all of our trials. And this Advent season, I pray that we can come together with the spirit of giving, a spirit of sharing, the spirit of connectedness, and that we would um, put aside all the things that are not important and really truly take time to appreciate all the things that God has given us so that we can celebrate the true meaning of Christmas. And so wherever you find yourself today, wherever you are, know that uh, we are praying for you, that we are here for you, and that we hope that uh, if you don't have a home or, or a community of faith that you belong to, that you would contact us and we would love to get to know you. We would love to be a part of what God is doing in your life. And may you be blessed and may the grateful heart of our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ abide in your life as we continue to celebrate the joy and the life eternal given to us by God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. <laughs>